Hello, how's it got? How you guys doing? James here. Well, you have a good day, wherever you at. A good evening, good morning, whatever you wherever you see this video. And uh, I'm, I'm having a pretty wild time myself. You know, I try not to do too many videos on certain individuals, but some people just keep popping up, and they said the most outlandish things I've ever heard. And this guy I'm about to show you, I bet I did videos on him in the past, Dr. Umar Johnson. This one, what, what you, this couple people who are in the Muslim faith, check out what he said about him when he was being raised a Muslim and what he said about the Muslim faith. And I'll make my commentary afterwards. It is still 
still anti-African culture in many regards. So Lord Johnson is saying that Islam is anti-African culture. I have no idea where he gets this from. First of all, there's no such thing as African culture. Africa is full of thousands of different ethnic groups. There's no single quote-unquote African culture. There are thousands of different cultures within Africa. This is a Western mentality to lump all Africans into one group. I'm a black American. My ancestors were slaves in the American South. However, I studied Islam in Senegal, West Africa, which is a predominantly Muslim country full of black people. I lived in Senegal, West Africa, studying Islam for three years. In fact, I still speak a little bit of Wallop. I can assure you, Senegalese culture, which is an African culture I'm most familiar with, Senegalese culture is alive and well in Senegal. The way Muslims in Senegal dress is way different from the way Muslims in Saudi Arabia dress. Islam does not reject culture. Islam rejects the bad parts of all cultures, whether it's American culture, Indian culture, Arab culture, or any other culture, Islam rejects the bad parts of those cultures. But the good parts of those cultures that do not violate the tenets of Islam are perfectly fine. My teachers in Senegal were not Arab. They were black, African, Muslim men who follow the Maliki Madhab. This claim from Omar Johnson is completely false. Now perhaps the Muslims that he encountered in Philadelphia, maybe some of them were anti-African culture, but that's not Islam, that's the people that he encountered. I was raised Muslim. Philadelphia has the largest percentage of African American Sunni Orthodox Muslims in the United States. Dearborn has the most Muslims overall, but they Arab. Yeah. If you're dealing with American Africans, non-nation of Islam, Orthodox Muslim, yeah. Philadelphia has more than any city in America. Speaking of Philadelphia, there are no official statistics to prove that Philadelphia has the largest percentage of black Sunni Muslims, but this is most likely an accurate statement. Philadelphia does have a large population of black Sunni or mainstream Muslims. I was raised in the very masjid that I believe the nation of Islam used to own. You understand? Before W. Warwick D. Muhammad took over his father's organization, shut that down, and came with the American Muslim movement. I was raised in one of those mosques. So this is interesting. Umar Johnson is saying that he grew up in a W. D. Muhammad masjid. Wallace D. Muhammad, who later changed his name to Walifu D. Muhammad, was the son of Elijah Muhammad, who was the founder of the Nation of Islam. When Elijah Muhammad died in 1975, his son, Walid Fadim Muhammad, we often just call him WD, he took over the movement and began moving them towards mainstream Islam. I am very familiar with the WD Muhammad community. I grew up in this community. I am still active in this community today. All of that is to say that I can definitely speak about this community with more authority than Omar Johnson. But I had to walk away because I saw how we completely ignored black people's problems. We completely ignored black culture. So now he's saying that Muslims, or at least the Muslims that he knew, ignored black culture. Now we have to give some background here. I think I heard in the past, I think I heard Dr. Omar mention on another podcast that his father was Muslim and his mother was Christian. Like many children who grew up like that, he was most likely exposed to both religions at a young age, Islam and Christianity. I also read somewhere that his parents divorced when he was young. Therefore, he was likely raised by his Christian mother and spent the weekends and holidays and time here and there with his Muslim father. If he did spend time as a child in a W.D. Muhammad affiliated masjid, there's no way they were not active in their community. Everyone knows that the W.D. Muhammad community came from the Nation of Islam. Even till today, it still has that legacy of involvement in the black community. Now, the W.D. Muhammad community may not do the things that Omar Johnson thinks they should do, but they do not ignore black culture. Society fears those who are different, but not me. Am I crazy? What your they do not ignore black culture. We completely ignored the black reality. It was all Islam. Learn your Arabic. And I'm like, I'm up, I'm a practicing Arab. I'm not practicing Islam. I'm practicing Arabism. Why do I gotta learn Arab language to worship God? 
Why do I got to eat like the Arab to worship God? Why do I got to dress like the Arab to worship God? This is not the worship of God. This is the deification of Arabic culture. Now this claim of practicing Arabism, I don't know which masjid he attended as a child, but this is an exaggeration. Yes, Islam does require that we make the five daily prayers in Arabic and that we recite the Quran in Arabic. That is a requirement in Islam. But that's about it. We have to pray in Arabic and we have to read the Quran in Arabic. But we do not have to mimic Arab culture. That is false. Nor do we have to speak Arabic all the time. Now some Arabic words do filter into our regular jargon. Like you will hear American Muslims say, Inshallah, like it's an English word. You hear us say, MashaAllah, and Assalamu Alaikum, and Bismillah, and Allahu Akbar, and Akhi, and Bukhti, and things like that. And for those people who want to go deep into Islamic studies, they will have to learn Arabic, but that's not most people. As I mentioned, I'm still involved with the WD Muhammad community even till today, and I've delivered many khutbahs, that's a sermon basically, at WD Muhammad affiliated masajid, and they were always in English. Yes, I use Arabic phrases here and there, and I try to translate them when I can, but the khutbah, the sermon, was predominantly in English. Most Muslim men at W.D. Muhammad Affiliated Masajid wear regular American clothes, which, by the way, is what Omar Johnson is wearing in this video. In some ways, black American Muslims sort of have a subculture that fuses some aspects of black culture, some aspects of mainstream American culture, and some aspects of Islamic culture altogether. Now, he also mentioned eating like an Arab. How does one eat like an Arab? I don't understand that. Does he mean eating with the right hand? That's like one of the few stipulations of eating that Islam has. We have to eat with the right hand. Is he talking about eating pork or drinking alcohol? I'm not sure what he means by eating like an Arab. Inshallah, I hope this helps to clarify some of the misunderstandings or misstatements coming from Dr. Omar Johnson. Again, my goal is not to discredit him or anything like that. I don't have oh, no, he, he doing a good job putting himself. He does have a far <laughs> make statements like this. We have to refute them. In my opinion, Dr. Umar Johnson should really just talk about those things that he's familiar with and that he really understands. Yes. If he wants to promote pan-Africanism, that's on him. He's free to do that. But when it comes to Islam, he doesn't know what he's talking about and he should really stay in his lane. Right. I agree. Muslim movement. I was raised in one of those mosques, you understand? But I had to walk away because I saw how we completely ignored black people's problems. We completely ignored black culture. We completely ignored the black reality. It was all Islam. Learn your Arabic. And I'm like, I'm up, I'm a practicing Arab. I'm not practicing Islam. I'm practicing Arabism. Why do I got to learn Arab language to worship God? Why do I got to eat like the Arab to worship God? Why do I got to dress like the Arab to worship God? This is not the worship of God. This is the deification of Arabic culture. And that's why I walked away from it. And now African spirituality is my foundation. In the name of Allah, beneficent, the merciful. I want to respond to a, a clip someone sent me by Dr. Umar Johnson where he was mentioning some of the reasons why he left Islam. Claiming that Islam didn't address the problems of the black community. And he mentioned that he in fact, wasn't learning Islam, he was learning Arabism. And he said, why do I have to learn the language of the, the Arabs in order to worship God? You know, and so he's casting blame upon Islam for these reasons. In response to this, first and foremost, as it is well known amongst all Muslims, and even many non-Muslims, is that the religion of all the prophets and messengers was Islam. And there are many proofs for that. From, from those proofs is the statement of Allah in his book. And were you present when death reached Yaqub, Jacob, and he said to his sons, what will you worship after? He said, we'll worship your God the God of your fathers, Ibrahim, Abraham, Ismail, Ishmael, and Ishaq, Isaac, Ilaham Wahida, Ilaham Wahida, 
one God alone. And we are submitting as Muslims to him. So this shows right here that the religion of all the prophets was Islam. And it's known that Jacob wasn't an Arab or Arab as he says. Nor was Ibrahim, Abraham. Nor was Ishmael and nor was Isaac. But they were all Muslims. Uh, that's from one perspective. Another perspective is it is as if Dr. Umar Johnson believes that there is only one type of worship or one act of worship within Islam which is the prayer which is said in Arabic. And no doubt this is false. As for worship in Islam, it's a comprehensive term for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with from statements and actions. So there are many acts of worship. From that is the prayer, the five obligatory prayers. From that is fasting. From that is hajj. From that is charity. From that is slaughtering. From that is vowing and sacrificing. From that is obedience to the parents. There are many acts of worship. And Islam. And it's no, no one from, according to my knowledge, these scholars of Islam said all these acts of worship must be done in the Arabic language. Fasting, how would that even be done in the Arabic language? Yeah, this is an act of worship. You're worshiping God by fasting, by withholding from food and drink, charity. These, these acts of worship. They don't require the Arabic language. Nor does supplication, calling upon Allah, asking Allah for your needs. A person can call upon Allah in their language. Now the obligatory prayer, the salat, which is one type from the types of acts of worship in Islam, yes, it must be done in the Arabic language. This is how the Prophet ﷺ legislated it, that the prayer be done in Arabic. But that's one act of worship from the many acts of worship so for him to say and it shows his ignorance of Islam the reality of Islam for him to say that how, how do I why do I have to worship God in the language of the Arabs that's not precise at all and it shows that Dr. Omar Johnson is ignorant and misinformed of the reality of the religion of Islam. And no doubt, the Arabic language, although it's not required for all acts of worship, just as I clarified, but no doubt, Arab, the Arabic language is from the religion because the Quran was sent down to the Arabic language. Quran was sent down in the Arabic language so the Muslims Muslims all over the world yeah. Indonesia Malaysia all throughout Africa North Africa and likewise many other countries in Africa many of them may learn the book of Allah meaning the Quran and they recite it and they learn it in the Arabic language as it was revealed as it came down from Allah to Angel Jibril, from Angel Jibril to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And Prophet Muhammad, he taught it to his companions. And from the companions of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from them were blacks, from them were Persians, from them were Arabs, from them were Romans. And further Allah, he mentioned, O oh mankind, Indeed, we have created you from male and female, and we made you tribes and nations so that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noblest of you in front of God, in front of Allah, is the most pious. So the Islam is not about a skin color. It's not about a skin color. It's about the one who has piety in front of God, no matter they're black, no matter if no matter if they're white, no matter if they're Arab, no matter if they're not Arab. So these are just some doubts from Dr. Umar Johnson 
that I'd like to quickly address. I'm going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide him to that which is correct and keep the Muslims firm upon their religion. And all praise due to Allah, the Lord of all creation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I received a message from a brother about a video clip that went viral. Dr. Omar explains why he left Islam. Why do I need to learn the Arab language to worship God? So brother, he sent me this video with the message, Assalamu alaikum, I think a video on this topic would be beneficial because me personally, one of the most common rejections I get from non-Muslims for not accepting Islam is, I'm not joining no Arab religion. So without further ado, let's take a look at the clip and then I will share my thoughts, inshallah. The movement. I was raised in one of those mosques, you understand? But I had to walk away because I saw how we completely ignored black people's problems. We completely ignored black culture. We completely ignored the black reality. It was all Islam. Learn your Arabic. And I'm like, I'm up, I'm a practicing Arab. I'm not practicing Islam. I'm practicing Arabism. Why do I got to learn Arab language to worship God? Why do I got to eat like the Arab to worship God? Why do I got to dress like the Arab to worship God? This is not the worship of God. This is the deification of Arabic culture. And that's why I walked away from it. And now African spirituality is my foundation. So it's very unfortunate that he decided to leave Islam. And it sounds like he had a negative experience. I can't speak on the specific history that he went through or the community that he comes from. However, I'm just going to share some thoughts and some facts about Islam. So while Muslims and people within the Muslim community might fall short of its teachings, or rather I should say definitely fall short of its teachings, Islam itself doesn't actually teach some of the things that he had an issue with in his video. So the first thing that he said was, We completely ignored black people's problems. We completely ignored black culture. We completely ignored the black reality. So not only does the religion of Islam not to teach us to ignore, as he put it, black people's problems. But if anything, Islam teaches us to actually help people overcome their problems. And the only reason I'm even mentioning the word black people is because this is what he's mentioning, because Islam doesn't differentiate between people based on their color. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, explicitly stated this in his quote where he said, there's no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, or a non-Arab over an Arab, nor a white person over a black person, nor a black person over a white person, except in piety. So the only thing that makes one person better than another person is their piety, their righteousness. And this is something that we find repeated in the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For example, in the Quran, Allah tells us, O oh mankind, indeed we have created you from a male and a female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and aware. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also taught us that indeed Allah does not look at your outer appearances or your wealth, but rather he looks at your hearts and your deeds. And I could go on and on. Islam teaches us that we all come from Adam, the first human being that Allah made. We all are part of the same tribe in that we are the tribe of Prophet Adam, the first human being. But of course, over time throughout history, we became smaller and more specific tribes that speak different languages and have different cultures, which segues into what he said about black culture. There's a well-known foundational principle in Islam that teaches when it comes to culture, when it comes to our daily lives, everything by default is permissible. The only time something becomes impermissible is if there is a proof against it. We don't have to dress like an Arab. We don't have to eat like an Arab. Now, with that said, there is one specific thing that is important that is linked to the Arabs, and that is the Arabic language. Now, firstly, not all people that speak Arabic are Muslim. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his own family, who spoke Arabic better than the Arabs do today, many of them fought against him and did not become Muslim. So just because somebody is an Arab does not mean that they are by default a Muslim. In fact, most Muslims are not Arab, although most Arabs are Muslim. But not all Arabs are Muslim. And when it comes to Allah sending a final messenger to all of humanity, if he's going to be a human being that comes from the lineage of Adam, السلام, the first human being, then he's going to come from some tribe, some nation, some ethnicity, some culture. So Allah, with his perfect wisdom, sent his final messenger to come from the Arabs. And the Arabic language at that time was the most eloquent of languages. Thus the Quran itself is a miracle in and of itself because its eloquence is beyond human capability. 
Hence, Allah says in the Quran, and if you are in doubt about what we have sent down, referring to the Quran, upon our servant, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then produce a surah, produce a chapter, the like thereof, and call upon your witnesses, other than Allah, if you should be truthful. But if you do not, and you will never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is people and stones prepared for the disbelievers. So Allah sent his final book in the Arabic language, and this is why Muslims learn Arabic. It's to understand the preserved word of Allah, our Creator. So even as a Muslim, when we are studying the Arabic language, we're not studying the type of Arabic that Arabs themselves use to converse in their day-to-day -day lives. And if we go down this line of thinking of wanting a prophet who spoke our language or was from our ethnicity, then hypothetically speaking, let's imagine that Allah did send a messenger who was black, who was African. And by the way, I should mention that throughout history, every nation did receive a messenger. Allah tells us in the Quran, and we certainly sent into every nation a messenger. And not only that, but they also spoke the language of their people, as Allah tells us also in the Quran. And we did not send any messenger except speaking in the language of his people to state clearly for them. However, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the final messenger. And something unique about him is that he was sent for all of mankind. And Allah, with his perfect wisdom, he chose Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who spoke Arabic. But just to get back to that hypothetical scenario, imagine that there was a messenger who was sent and he was black. Let's say that he was African. Whoever Allah sent that messenger to would not have a valid excuse if they rejected that messenger because they didn't like the color of their skin or the language that they spoke or the tribe that they came from. Even within Africa, there are different tribes. Would other African tribes have the excuse to reject that messenger because he didn't come from their tribe? There are also many different languages spoken in Africa. So the bottom line is, Islam clearly teaches us that no person is better than another person based on their ethnicity, based on their lineage or the language that they speak. The thing that makes a person better than another person is their piety, is their righteousness. And Islam does not tell us to get rid of our cultures. Islam does not force us to adopt Arab culture. As long as different aspects of our culture are within the guidelines of Islam, they're perfectly fine. Allah knows best. Thank you for watching. May Allah guide Dr. Umar Johnson back to Islam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bondage. And you got people that's capping. You got. I'm gonna play a little bit of this. It was breaking down why he felt like he, uh, you know, P. Diddy had been getting uh, investigated by the feds. Now, I'm gonna let you guys hear what. Dr. Umar Johnson had to say in just a second, uh, which then sparked D.L. Hewley to go crazy on Dr. Umar Johnson. And I mean, D.L. Hewley went unbelievably ballistic on Dr. Umar Johnson. Now, I'm going to say this before we get started. I think that Dr. Umar Johnson, I don't know if he should respond because I think that D.L. is setting the trap. And the reason why I say that is because I think if, if Dr. Umar, who probably will respond, but if he does respond, I think that DL is going to try and put him in a trick bag of, well, where is the school at? And I think that DL is going to change that to the conversation of, where is the school uh, that you've been saying that you was going to, and I don't think that, I don't know if Umar wants to go that direction with it. So I think that DL, by going crazy like he did on the dude, I think he kind of set the, the groundwork, you understand what I'm saying? I think DL uh, smartly, in a way, set the groundwork. Y'all smash the like button as y'all come on in, and don't forget to click the link at the top, and uh, uh, subscribe to the podcast show. I'll be doing a live podcast show later on tonight, so make sure y'all subscribe to the podcast show. Uh, the link is pinned in the chat room, but I think that that is what DL is going to go to if Umar tries to come back at DL, I think that DL is going to go right to that. Uh, a lot of people do that with Umar. Uh, whenever he says something, they go right to the school and say, well, where's the school at? You know what I'm saying? Uh, you ain't never got to school there. That's what they're going to say uh, to Umar. And so, you know, I, I think that that's where he's going to try and take that with, with Umar. And I don't know if Umar wants to go down that road again right now. But Umar, again, he went on my brother. This all got started because, first of all, Umar, uh, Dr. Umar went on his channel and he said some things 
And I guess he felt like some people took him out of context, but he said some things that just factually were not true uh, in regards to the Diddy, uh, you know, case by the feds. And so Umar came back, went on, did an interview with uh, the Art of Dialogue, and on that interview, um, this is what he said. And then I'm going to let you guys hear with... uh, what D.L. Hewley said. Let's go. Sean Puffy Combs indictment. You know, I had made a comment on my social media earlier today because I was a little disappointed in the fact that so many of our people misinterpreted my comments about Sean Puffy Combs as being indicative of my desire to see him evade accountability for any crimes that he may have committed. So to clarify that, this is where I stand on the Sean Puffy Combs indictment. If Sean Puffy Combs is guilty on any of the three counts of that federal indictment, if he's guilty of sexually trafficking people against their will, if he's guilty of participating in arson and bribery and kidnapping and all of these things that they're accusing him of, if they can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he engaged in these things, then like anyone else, if you do the crime, you should do the time. But when I look at those indictments, first of all, when I look at the racketeering count of the indictment, and of course, I'm not an attorney, but when I look at racketeer and feel influence corrupt organization, I'm saying to myself, Sean Combs, from what I understand, because I don't know the man personally, he did not build Bad Boy on criminal money. Bad Boy was built legitimately through the legal channels of the music industry. He might have engaged in crime using Bad Boy property after he built Bad Boy. But did he use criminal funding in in crime to create Bad Boy. I don't think he did. Now, maybe RICO extends to you simply engaging in crime on company time. Now, if they're saying he sexually trafficked women on company time and that constitutes RICO, then he might be guilty. But everybody who knows Puff knows that he came into the the music industry the right way, he hustled the right way, and he built his empire the right way. It appears that all the free calls in the alleged sexual trafficking, the alleged interstate prosecution, that may have come after the fact. So the question becomes, can he still be convicted of RICO charge if he simply engaged in sexual activities that did not directly have to do with the business, but he did it on company time, he did it in company property. So that would be a, clar- a clarifying issue that I would like to see explained. So that's one piece. Now, when I look at the sexual trafficking, Again, he could be innocent, he could be guilty. But when I look at a Sean Puffy Combs being a mogul, being as popular who he is, as he is, I don't see why he would need to kidnap people and sexually traffic them across state lines and then force them to engage in, in, in sexual behavior. I really can't see that. Again, I'm not saying he's innocent, I'm not saying he's guilty. I'm simply saying as thirsty as people can be, men and women for fame, for attention, I don't think Sean Puffy Combs has to force anybody Okay, into sexual trafficking. I don't see him needing to sell people against their will across state lines to engage in sex. I don't see it. I do not believe he's guilty of sex trafficking, but I could be wrong because I don't know what the evidence is. So the racketeering piece, I'm a little uncertain of. The sex trafficking piece, on the surface, I don't believe he's guilty of that because I don't think he needs to forcibly sell anybody or traffic anyone. Now, the third count of the federal indictment is where I think they might get given. Interstate pros- of prostitution. Did Sean Puffy Combs influence people, pay people, bribe people to come across state lines and engage in sexual activity? He may very well be guilty of that. So then the question becomes, for me, what is the maximum he can get fed time for engaging in interstate prostitution? And interestingly, when you look at the federal definition of prostitution, it does not require an exchange of money. It can be a prize, it can be a a, a material benefit. And you know, Puffy, he kind of flashy. All the hip-hop guys who got money, they pretty flashy. So he might say, hey, if you do this, I'll give you this. Or what if he just gave them rewards for complying with his request? In other words, there was no upfront business arrangement for sex. There was no upfront business arrangement for sex. Hypothetically, he brings them into New York. He brings them into L.A. He brings them into Miami. They do what they do. 
And as a means of him flexing his power and his money, I'm going to buy you this car. I'm going to take care of your bills. She wasn't expecting nothing but time with Puff. She wasn't expecting nothing but participation in the free call. But because she was rewarded for her participation in the free call, does that meet the federal definition of prostitution? Now, let me stop right there before I get to what DL said, because I'm going to go through what Umar said first. Uh, let, let, let's start with the beginning of what Dr. Umar said. And, you know, salute to Dr. Umar, man. I ain't got nothing personal against him. You know what I'm saying? Salute to Dr. Umar. Um, he said that he doesn't think that Bad Boy was built off of dirty money, right? Um, how would any of us know? How would any of us know that? Unless we was with Bad Boy when it was constructed. So that's an opinion. That's not a fact. He says he, but he says he thinks that. Secondly, he says he doesn't think that P. Diddy would have to force any woman to do anything against their will. You would think that any any particular person would think that any any of us would think, hey man, a famous person doesn't have to force somebody to do something against their will. Does that make that true? No, it doesn't make that true. That makes that an illusion. That's like saying uh, any famous person that y'all see, the most famous person that y'all see, oh, well, they ain't got to force nobody to do something. Everybody's just going to lay down. Well, every woman is not just going to lay down with every man, regardless of whether or not you're a celebrity or not. Right. These are facts. Some people operate off a code of morals. Some people operate off a code of certain ethics. Right. Some people like to be in a party, but they don't want to take it that far. They just want to be at the party. Right. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And so That's you got to look at these different things. And I think Dr. Umar should have kind of thought about that statement. When well, he, said he doesn't think, think that, he would, <laughs> that, that he did that, that he, had, that he uh, needed to force any woman. On, he doesn't think that he forced any woman against their will. Right. Well, you just don't know. It doesn't, ma- it doesn't matter because you're a celebrity that you have to force somebody against their will. Just because you be a celebrity don't matter. Don't mean that, hey, I had to do this. I didn't have to do that. So I disagree with Dr. Umar on that. You understand what I'm saying? But I understand his premises of saying, hey, Diddy's a, he's a famous guy. Why he got to force somebody? Well, you had a lot of people. And, and let me tell you something. I've always learned this. When there's smoke, there's fire, right? A lot of people cap him, right? A lot of people cap him. A lot of people just out here jumping on the bandwagon. That's true. But some of these people telling the truth. Right. And that's where the problem is right there. Right. Forget all the people that's capping. Right. What about the people that's telling the truth? Right. Because you're not telling us everybody's lying. Right. See, I think Dr. Umar got confused because he saw that the feds only put out this first indictment and they only put one victim in the first indictment. Right. The fans stated that they already had an ongoing investigation and a superseding indictment is coming where they're going to hit this dude with multiple victims, multiple cases, multiple different things. I think people got to understand one thing about the feds. The feds don't have a 99% conviction rate for nothing. No. They're not playing no games. No. So I think people think that, oh man, these guys are lying and capping on them. Bro, when the feds come get you, They've got a few things. They've probably got video evidence, yeah. photo evidence, right. text messages. Mm-hmm. They've probably got a, a, a money trail, mm-hmm. bank evidence, all these things, witnesses, all of these things to put together. So when they go to court, they line you up with this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. That's why the feds work differently than the state. Mm-hmm. It's easier to win a case against the states than to beat the feds because the feds, when they come, they're only going to really come to charge you when they know they got you dead to rights. So I think that's the part that people are missing. And I think people are hoping right. that Diddy is that 0.8% that will beat the feds and his charges will be true. But this is the one thing I think that we all have to understand. When you look at guys who you look up to, and I see they do this in the community with all the basketball players, all the football players, all the star athletes. When you're young, you grow up, you idolize a person. I don't care who it is. Whoever it is you look up to, you idolize them. It's hard for you to see them doing something wrong. Yeah. Because in your eyes, you don't know them, they can do no wrong. Right. Right? But they're human just like you, just like me. They make mistakes. Exactly. And I think that people in general put people on superhero levels. Right. And put people 
who we see as big figures in our community exactly. just because they made it to a certain level of success we can't believe exactly. that they would do anything wrong or they exactly. would break any laws or they would do any of these negative dirty things that people say exactly. and that's far from the truth you understand what I'm saying because nobody walking this earth is perfect no man walking this earth nobody. no man, woman, nobody walking this earth no is perfect everybody has made mistakes and has mistakes attached to them True. you understand what I'm saying so I think that when we look at these guys, I don't think that you can look at these guys uh, from, and, 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 and we're going to get to that in a second, but that's how I feel about it. That's why I always say, I never look at celebrities like celebrities. I don't. I talk to celebrities like normal people because they are. I think some people take themselves out of a realm and they look at celebrities and they talk to these people like they're God and they're not God. Right. They didn't create the heaven. They didn't create the earth. Nope. And when they die, all these things, the, Lambo, the Lambos, the Ferraris, the, uh, all that stuff. That's true. It's meaningless. Right. It doesn't mean anything to them no more. You can't take it with when you. When you leave, you leave the same way as everybody else. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? In a prime box. Exactly. Or whatever. If you got more money, it's gold or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But you're going six feet or you're getting cremated. But you're about it. Right. Right? So. Very true. Let's go on. And finish hearing what Dr. Umar said. And then I want to play what D.L. Hewley said so y'all can understand what D.L. Hewley was responding to. And let's, let's, let's finish. The same thing with my wrinkle charge question. I don't believe he built his music empire illegally. But if he engaged in illegal activity, not related to the music empire, but he used the music empire property to do it, does that also meet the federal definition of a RICO charge? And me personally, Art, I believe the reason they went RICO and the reason they want they went fed is they want to completely destroy Sean Puppy Combs uh, publicly and financially because this could have very easily been state charges. Well, that's not true. And let me tell you why. First of all, why would they want to destroy Diddy when they had nothing to do with this case? until Diddy's ignorance allowed them to come into this case. Case in point. And see, if I was talking to Dr. Umar, shout out to my boy, uh, Arna Dallow. If I was talking to Dr. Umar, I'd say this to you. Dr. Umar, if it wasn't for the blatant ignorance and fucking stupidity of Sean P. Diddy Combs, to know, and I'm gonna repeat myself again, everybody listening to this video, excuse my language, but I gotta get busy on this one. Cause we gotta educate each other and think, gotta use our brain. P. Diddy in his brain knew that he beat the living shit out that girl. Mm -hmm. He knew he beat the fuck out of her and tried to kick her head like it was a 50 yard fucking field goal. And you know what else he knew? He knew that shit was on tape. So the nerve of this ignorant, dumb son of a bitch, P. Diddy, to come out, right? First of all, not pay the girl so that the lawsuit never came out. When she first came up to you with the lawsuit, if you would have paid her, none of this other stuff would be happening right now. None of it. So everybody keeps talking about, oh, yeah, the IGO and all these people said, no, no, no. This stupid, ignorant son of a bitch, P. Diddy, this, this dude right here on your screen, right? If he would have paid Kathy before the lawsuit came out, we ain't talking about no liquor company. We ain't talking about no setup. We ain't talking about nothing. You know why? Because nobody would have ever known that lawsuit would have never hit the street. But his ignorance, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? His ego and his pride right. would not allow himself to pay that girl right. and get her on up out of here about her weight. Right? Right? So what happens? He plays hardball and she files the lawsuit. She files the lawsuit and then what happens? Everybody in their mama see the paperwork and they see the allegations against Puff. Because the lawsuit is made public once she files it. So all of these accusations she put against Puff that was in that lawsuit could have avoided hitting the public eye if P. Diddy would have just paid her a settlement before that lawsuit came out. That has nothing to do with a liquor company or anybody else. We got to be honest now with ourselves. We got to be honest with ourselves. Everybody asks, well, why ain't they going after all these white guys and blah, 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 blah. Well, a lot of the white guys that they're talking about are paying these ladies off. So you're never hearing their stories. They're actually paying. Boom. 
Have you did research and saw how many lawsuits Vince McMahon have paid off? So now when you pay these girls off, before they even come and release the lawsuits, mm-hmm. the lawsuits never hit the light of day. Right. Right? Right. So the mm-hmm. details yep. never hit the light of day. P. Diddy did not want to pay that girl. But then this is where he destroyed himself, and I told y'all this on the first day. You knew it was a tape out there of you beating the brakes off that girl. That girl alleged in the lawsuit that you beat her. You saw what she was going to put out in the lawsuit before she put it out because her lawyers come to you first. Right. You still didn't want to settle with that girl pay her no money. Mm-hmm. They dropped the lawsuit on your helmet. All those details get put out about how all the sexual activity happened and how she was beaten, all these other things, and people demonized that girl. For about cold two weeks, people demonized her, said she was a liar, she's capping. Diddy came out in a statement and said it's all a lie. None of it's true. Diddy put out a statement. None of it's true. It's all lies, y'all. I never did anything to her. I never disrespected her. I never touched her. It's all lies. The ignorance of this man knowing there's a tape out there knowing that you beat this girl ass on tape so now let's say okay you want to sit out here and demonize this girl and make it seem like she was lying but all you had to do was pay her and all this stuff would not be happening right think about get on the stage Wayne Lee if I'm getting up because I'll be thinking a hundred steps ahead of all these people right they drop the tape. Instantly kills his credibility. He's done. Now he came out and settled 24 hours after she dropped that lawsuit. Settled. ASAP. You know what that did? Everybody said, oh, all these other people come chasing for money. No. All the other people who are afraid to go against this dude because he has so much power. You got mayors behind this dude, other elected officials behind this dude, this dude out here campaigning in the past, the voter die campaign for the presidency of the United States, this dude had deep connections. So if your lawyer's trying to come up, hey, I ain't trying to go against this shit, I'll get black I'll get blackballed in my circle and won't get no bread. But once Kathy came out and got that settlement, and then that video came out, floodgates open now. Mm-hmm. Because now his true character has been put out there. Mm -hmm. And he comes with an apology. Right? Mm -hmm. Says what he did in the video was wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? But once again, how did all this start? This didn't start because of Diageo and all these other people and oh, racism and all this other lame ass excuses that these niggas be putting in there. It didn't happen because of that. It happened because of the ignorance and the blatant stupidity of P. Diddy to when he had a chance to control that situation and pay that girl before the lawsuit came out, he didn't pay her. He didn't settle it in private and it went public. That is the reason why this whole situation went public. A lot of people quiet now, but you know I'm preaching the truth. If P. Diddy paid that girl, you wouldn't be talking about Diageo, you wouldn't be talking about no exposing, you wouldn't be talking about none of this other stuff. So now, once people are seeing that this dude is vulnerable, everybody that ever had a beef with him, all the people that felt the way about how he shit on them and treated them like crap all throughout his, his natural career, right? Now they're lining up to get a piece of this dude because they didn't have the strength to do it before because they didn't think that they could go ahead and achieve victory and going against this guy because the machine was too strong behind him. But once they saw vulnerability, that's when you see all these people coming. Now you see other people capping coming in too. Because they're like, well, shit, everybody going to get this shot. I might as well cap and try and get me some too. And that's what those saw in the game. Is you got some people capping, some people lying. But that doesn't get away from the basis of the situation of why P. Diddy is in all of this situation right now. Because of his arrogance to know that he had a tape out there of him beating the holy hell out of this girl to lie about it 
and still not pay the girl, knowing she was going to put those details in that lawsuit and it was going to be public. So the arrogance of this dude, he never thought that tape was going to get put on CNN and blasted to the world. He thought that the black community and everybody was going to have his back and stand ten toes for him and call her a liar and say everything she said was cap. Even if some of what she said was cap, which I believe. He still lied and said he never abused that woman and put his hands on her. And I'm going to cut it right there. And Ticket TV is right. And one, one thing I just want to focus is on Umar. Now, Umar been to Africa. He's had some trips over to Africa. You mean to tell me that when you was over in Af some parts of Africa, I, don't, I think he went to Ghana and a couple other places, did it ever occur to you? Have you ever sit down and really talk with the people over there? I wanted to do any other people that them countries he went to would hear something, hear what he's saying. There are different, like the like the, the three guys are saying, there are three different, you know, they're, they're, they're Muslims all over Africa, even in, in the countries, in some countries where there's a small percentage of them. And you didn't, you didn't bother seeing something like that? He makes these uncrazy comments, and I wanted you know, do a little bit of what he said about, and he he was, and he was right about what he said about P Diddy. But this guy, how can anybody take everything out of his mouth seriously? I think when Tariq Nasheed introduced this man, <laughs> geez, brought him to his, on his movie. He's been like, he's been like, at first. You know, he would seem like he has some intelligence because I thought he did at one point too. But man, the more he talks, the more outrageous and things that I that he just says some stuff. It's like then he said, I guess he don't think. Do he don't think? He don't think any time before he says something out of his mouth. He don't think things through. And I mean, I've never met a person that just kept saying. I mean. I might say some things and I had to think back like, ooh, maybe I have to retract that or, or think something. But someone that just keep going and saying things, things and violent things after things I've, I've never heard of. And I'm glad I played the video to show that the people who are in the Muslim faith can tell you what they're, they're you know, what they were taught in the mosque. But this guy, man, he <laughs> just Oh my goodness, how, and it's unbelievable people follow someone like him and really take him for word. And he thinks he's the highest scholar. He's in a guy, what, like the one guy, he definitely ain't no revolutionary because a revolutionary, they ain't gonna let you into their country. And that's very true. Umar, Umar is just a mouth. He talk all this stuff and the people can start to see right through. <laughs> and the man even, was even say he was in the faith and around a group of people. I mean, everything he, he brings and, and he put him on podcasts and he say some outlandish stuff that like, and, and someone had to come from, from somewhere and de debunk and dispute. And he would say that he's a doctor. What doctor or what? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Doctor or what? He haven't even practiced. He don't even stay up currently on his practice. He's out gallivanting around around the country. He's not really in his field. So to really call somebody a doctor, you know what I mean, it's just like, he don't act like a doctor. He don't act like a professional. He don't even look like a professional. I mean, even, even the ones who are politically activists, who are professors, they don't act, talk and act like that. The ones who are in, you know, Pan-African studies or, or in state, this guy is just, my goodness. And what he, I'm, I'm, it's a, damn, if I was his kids, I think I would be embarrassing. Your daddy just embarrassing the hell out of, out of, I, man, I, <laughs> they got to be embarrassed. If anybody know his, I'd be embarrassed if I was his child. Man, they make a fool and just come out and just say some blatant statements. And someone has to come back and say, wait a minute, whoa, where did this come from? This is not what we we study and we teach. I'm like, oh my goodness. 
just have to hear from the people in the Muslim faith itself. He don't know what he's talking about. You know, he just so. And then he and then he goes all places over to the continent of Africa. Oh my goodness, it's you know, I don't know how some people from Africa hear from. Him. They got they got to look at this guy like he freaking nuts. You know, I mean, he's like, damn, this is what kind of black Americans come out of America? <laughs> Keep stay over, stay over there, shit. I mean, that gotta be embarrassing, man. You know, he don't have no respect, no etiquette, no culture, the aware. He just, and and I think he talked to a segment of black people that believe anything that come out of his mouth. You know, and somebody who's been over in different countries, been to the islands, he been in these places, and he just. It's just unfucking. It's just excuse me. It's just unbelievable. Like, are you serious? You know. And just just say things that, you know. And the reason why he agrees with because he got the same spirit. He got the same arrogance. It's Petty Diddy Combs. He act like he got the same spirit. That's why he don't believe. What if I well if Petty Diddy did this? You never know it. That's what, and I agree with Ticket TV on that one. He got, he got the same arrogance, and people are like, well, out of respect for him, it's like, but he just, he makes himself sound so ignorant. Online, it's like some people be shaking their head, like I can't believe he said that, and it's not like he's he ain't been out the country. He's, he's met people from there. He met people from different. You know, I'm pretty sure you went to the continent of Africa. I mean, I'm pretty sure you've seen all different type of religions and stuff over there. I mean, <laughs> oh my goodness! And as a man, I mean, even if a Pan African is, I, I wonder what they gotta be thinking. You know, they were trying to set up company here. What, what, what is the heck is he talking about? <laughs> but uh, you know, he just he got some land of story, boy. But anyway, I just wanted to play that video. But yeah. Um, I don't know what something wrong with that man. I'm just and I, I and he just run off at the mouth and it's just like damn he just say anything. He just I mean if, if he gotta say you scratching his between his legs, he he gotta let you know about it. He'll make a video about it all the time. <laughs> He's on video constantly. And people all over who follow all over the, the social media follow some of the things he say. Yeah. <laughs> he just say anything. You know, it's like uh, sniffing and snorting and everything. <laughs> <coughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, y'all, uh, let me get off here. But yeah, uh, yeah, he, he needs to really spend some time and, and talk to some people and stop being so Mr. Know-it-all and, and sit down and let people tell you about their culture. You need to get and study more about the African culture, if that's your thing. Because I don't think he knows enough. You need to really sit down and, and meet different Africans. Let them let them talk. Keep your mouth quiet and let them tell you what's really going on. And they, they can tell you. People from different parts of Africa. Because it's not, you don't know crap. It's a darn shame you go halfway around the world and don't and say some crazy stuff like that about someone's religion. Knowing that they're saying there are people in the religion on the continent of Africa in the Caribbean and other places. <laughs> Alright then y'all, y'all take it easy. Be blessed and hey, if you take if you take your children to him, I feel sorry for you. Take care, be blessed.